Many thanks for that. And I'd like to begin by thanking the organisers for placing me after Jeremy Ashby and magnifying my anxiety about 100 fold. <laughs> um, but really, for organising this fascinating event. And I would like to also not turn into an Oscar speech, but I must thank my supervisor, my former supervisor, Paul Crossley, who is sitting here, for being a continuing inspiration and for being very much present in this paper, even though he's not actually responsible for it. So. <laughs> I have to begin this paper with a confession. On entering the Imperial Treasury at Vienna's Hofburg in 12, 2016, I experienced something that can only be described in an, as an anagogical spiritual moment. Like the 12th century abbot Suja of Saint Denis, I too felt called away from earthly cares and through the multicolored loveliness of the treasure before me, I was momentarily transported from this inferior level to that superior one to his quote Suja. With its hushed velvet interiors, its strategically positioned lighting which caresses the gleaming objects while plunging everything else into near darkness, the Vienna Schatzkammer intentionally plays up the preciousness and visual power of the objects on display. Quite where that power emanates from is harder to identify in this eclectic medieval collection of obsolete uh, coronation vestments and regalia and to a modern observer, questionable relics of the passion. The extraordinary craftsmanship of the oversized, almost superhuman vestments is undoubtedly striking. The tactile nature of some of its items, the socks, the gloves, the shoes, offer a palpable link with the past. We can imagine the wearer in their full regalia and also puzzle on how they fit a differently proportioned men over the centuries, how they were assembled on the day, whether they had inhibited movement while adding to the sense of majesty. The intrinsically precious quality of the imperial insignia and reliquaries, Suje's multicolored loveliness of gems, extends their allure far beyond, beyond their now lost semi religious function. For me, this was also an end of a personal journey, which began with an epiphany on that very same spot a decade earlier and has led to years of study of the treasure, and in particular its role in shaping the devotional landscape and the urban topography of four medieval cities. But my research covered only a small part in their long and suspenseful past, which runs like a thread through German history. <laughs> through me, King's rule, declared the imperial crown. The source of early rule is divine, as the enthroned image of Christ clearly shows. But in their long history, the instruments which confer the right to rule have themselves acquired supernatural power. More than mere symbols of rulership, the insignia were objects of desire, conflict, and forgery. They were a barometer of national self-fulfillment. Here, Germania bemoaned the loss of the empire as imagined by Philip White and much copied by his fellow Nazarene painters. The empire is personified by its iconic objects and places, the forlorn crown, the golden bull, the medieval constitution of the empire, the sword and the shield with the double eagle, the pastoral rhine and the distant massing of Cologne Cathedral. The image appeared in the critical decades before the unification of Germany, but the imperial insignia of the first Reich were often seen as an oracle for the future empires. This First World War monument shaped like a crown implores the subjects to follow the emperor to victory through suffering and death. Every aspect of the insignia is laden with potential symbolism that has transcended their immediate function. The iconic octagonal form of the crown itself is often associated with the shape of Charlemagne's cha chapel in Aachen and even with the platform at Rennes where German kings are said to have been elected in the Middle Ages. In modern in modern European history, Charlemagne's crown jewels have frequently been deployed to legitimize political discourse. Both Napoleon and Hitler, in their separate ways, believed and tried to convince others that they were reviving Charlemagne's imperial project, although the crown uh, was spirited away to Vienna shortly before the arrival of Napoleon's troops to Aachen. The moving encounter you see here on the right never actually took place. The loss of the crown was a lasting blow to Aachen, the place where German kings had been crowned since the 9th century, and the city commission, at a 
considerable cost, a set of copies of Insignia in 1915. These replicas were used in Tableau Vivant staging for Charmaine's anniversary, which you see here on the left, and also in more light-hearted moments at the end of World War II. The imperial crown and everything it stood for could be the subject of exaltation and parody in equal measure. But how did we come to this? In order to understand that, we need to return to the 14th century and consider how the perception and presentation of the imperial insignia changed fundamentally under the Luxembourg dynasty. Let me begin by offering some background. Since, and apologies to those of you who know this all too well, since Charlemagne's anointment in Rome in 800, only Roman coronation bestowed the imperial title on the Roman king. But the coronation insignia had for centuries been seen as divine instruments of the imperial office, and their ownership alone conferred the right to rule. In addition to the insignia, the imperial treasure also contained a large number of relics, including a set of passion relics, whose custody was originally the exclusive prerogative of the Santana Empress in Constantinople. Although some of the relics, the Holy Lands, the True Cross, for example, were thought to have been collected by Constantine, by the 14th century, it was firmly believed that the insignia were the authentic crown jewels of Charlemagne. In truth, many of these objects were made for the members of the Zabian dynasty two centuries after Charlemagne's death. The most important among them were the crown, the imperial sword, the orb, and various coronation robes added by the Bonham Charlemagne rulers. The centerpiece of the collection was the heavy last kept in the 11th century, the jewel processional cross, which you see here on the right, but when opened, also revealed a fragment of the true cross, relics of St. Anne's and John the Baptist, and a nail wedged into the spear of the martyr chapel, which you see as well. Identified first as the lance of Constantine, and even as late as the 13th century as the lance of St. Morris, by the 14th century it had firmly been established as being the spear with which St. Gaius pierced Christ's side on the cross. As a potent symbol, the lance was carried in battles and ceremonies, and it conveyed a series of complex meanings which were exploited and elaborated by successive Holy Roman emperors. The arrival of these ancient, if not entirely authentic, items to Prague on Easter Sunday, 1350, opened a new chapter in their history, with lasting consequences for the religious landscape of several Central European cities. At the time of their removal from Munich to Prague, much anxiety was expressed in contemporary sources about the alienation of the sacred treasure from the German soil. Although that anxiety may have influenced Emperor Charles IV's tactical vagueness about its permanent location, the triumphant manner of its reception in Prague immediately set the tone. So, according to the Chronicle of Francis, the relics were first brought to Prague's ancient fortress of Vichyna at the bottom of this slide here. Where a solemn procession led by Charles IV and the Archbishop carried them to the heart of the town's recently founded colossal new district known as the New Town, and that's called here in Marsh Mountains, German Athletes, basically all of that, and here's Charles Square. Although Francis does not specify the exact New Town location, it is virtually certain that the relics uh, were taken to Charles Square, where they were exhibited for the very first time. The event, I believe, was commemorated subsequently in this Bohemian version of St. John Mandeville's Travels, where it allegedly shows Byzantine Emperor being presented at Passion Relics in Constantinople, but I have no doubt that this is actually Charles Square in Prague. Mm -hmm. This symbolic adventus of the Imperium, as the treasure was often referred to, into the Bohemian capital, stood in sharp contrast to its earlier, more secretive existence. For most of its history, the treasure was moved between dynastic residences of its keepers in the remote Hagenau, Trifos, Balkburg, and Kiborg, in Switzerland. Sightings of the treasure were rare outside major events, such as imperial coronations and burials, and they rewarded their viewers with nothing more than memories and their indulgences. First known public displays in Basel in 1315, Regensburg, and Nuremberg in 1323-24, were memorably staged, but still one-off events. The earliest concerted effort to provide a setting for a public display of insignia 
was made by Charles IV's predecessor and arch rival, Louis the Bavarian. Between 1323 and 1350, Munich, the capital of Louis's Wittelsbach family, played host to the insignia, and their presence in the city shored up Ludwig's contested claim to the imperial title. During that time, the relics were deposited in the chapel of his castle, the Elden Hall, which was remodeled into a hall, name, and a choir decorated with sculpture. Five months from Ludwig's Cistercian Foundation at Christenfeld, celebrated mass staying in the chapel. The chronicle composing the monastery around 1330, but whose evidence is sometimes doubted, described how, after Ludwig brought the relics of the city, thousands poured into the chapel, hoping to catch a glimpse of the treasure. Although Ludwig's desire to publicize the sacred treasure may have been motivated by the spurring political crisis of his reign and his ostracism by the highest ecclesiastical circles, it is beyond doubt that the public taste for its veneration grew rapidly in the first decades of the 14th century. The growing taste for communal spectacle was in tune with the change of religious climate of late of medieval Europe. Processions and relic displays, staged not only in the interiors, but also on the exteriors of churches, were attracting an increasing number of pilgrims and were seen as essential steps in the quest for personal salvation. Charles IV's ever-increasing collections, collection of sacred treasures, personal, royal, and imperial, resulted in a gradually evolving sequence of purposefully designed architectural settings. Between 1365 and 1424, Karlstein Castle was the permanent repository for the imperial treasure in Bohemia. The value of its context was reflected in the eschatological iconography of its chapels, culminating in the watchful phalanx of saints painted on the panels in the Holy Cross Chapel and on the dozen walls polished of polished semi-precious stone. This was Charles IV's own corner of heaven where his acquisitive devotion and his imperial rank were rewarded with an intimate audience with Christ himself, um, who receives Christ, uh, Charles, Charles' pledge of loyalty with a traditional feudal gesture of hand clasping. Yes, Charles. With its mixture of early Christian aesthetic, saint chapelle regal sacerdotum, and grail-inspired vision worthy of younger Tichero, Kalshtan presents a unique and complex variation of the traditional fortified princely Schatzkammer. Kalshtan's chapels serve that purpose for a range of relics distributed across its ascending structures in a suitably hierarchical order. One chapel, now entirely lost but described in the records, celebrated an absence of a relic and the stark confirmation of their miraculous powers. St. Nicholas's oratory in the lower palace marked the earthquake too. Depicted a miracle of St. Nicholas's bleeding figure, which vehemently resisted Charles IV's attempt to remove it from the Franciscan monastery in Prague's old town. Charles IV's more diplomatic attempts at relic collecting was celebrated in a well known sequence of murals in the Lesser Towers uh, Chapel of Our Lady. The gift of the fragment of the true cross and the thorn from the crown of thorns, there is some argument what relics have exactly been handed over here were assembled in this specially commissioned relic red cross, which you see here, and heretics in the flesh, um, which contained Charles IV's personal collection of the Passion relics, and was deposited in the intimate oratory of the instruments of the Passion of Our Lord, adjacent to the Chapel of Our Lady. So we were uh, here just a moment ago, and so it's through this little passage that we have here. This is the letter. The arrival of the relics into the chapel required for the decoration to be amplified with more eschatologically meaningful stone, precious stone, hence this a remnant of wall painting from a stage one of the decoration. The material reserved for other inner sanctums, such as the Holy Cross Chapel and that of St. Venceslas in St. Vitus Cathedral. The consecration of the Holy Cross Chapel in 1365 marked the end of the journey for the imperial treasure which was deposited into the spacious ombre below Tomasa de Modena's triptych. It's only purpose-built repository in its long history. Less clear is the treasure's initial location in Prague following that ceremonial entry in 1350. 
The chronicler banished the Carpenter's assertion that he was taken to the cathedral following its first public display has been frequently questioned since the arrival co coincided with the demolition of the old basilica and the erection of the new Gothic choir. Other locations have been sought in the city. The new town church of St. Charles of Karl in Czech, founded in 1350 in a manifest homage to Aachen and the first emperor, was singled out by Zenka Hlekikova as a fitting temporary treasury and the main reason desperate for its existence. However, the slow progress of building work and the perilous location of the church next to the new town walls makes that doubtful. So here is kind of just there. This is all new town bishop you can see at the beginning and Charles Square. So. I've argued in my doctoral thesis um, that the creation of the chapel in the cloister of the Benedictine uh, Emmaus Monastery, also in New Town, just here, with the recurrent images of the crucifixion now obliterated by these 19th century paintings that you see here, was directly connected with the occasional storage of the Passion Relics, but only prior to the annual display in Charles Square, which as you can see uh, was very, very um, close by. The new Gothic choir of St. Vitus Cathedral, on the other hand, maintained its own identity as a vast national pantheon of saints and insignia. Some of the collection went back to the pre-Romanesque roots of St. Vitus and to its founder, Venceslas, whose sanctified body rested in the chapel adjacent to the new south transept, just here. For pilgrims visiting the cathedral, the experience with sacred sites would be magnified by the presence of relics and royal treasure. These were divided between two sacristies on the north and the south side, so one above the other space here and the other there, tucked away in discrete chambers which were, which were hoisted above flamboyantly vaulted and decorated spaces that supported them. Thus, the coronation insignia of the crown lands of Bohemia were, and still are, kept in the Sacristia Nova above the south portal, uh, so these windows belong to it, yeah. an independent sacristy accessible only through the sealed door in the Venceslas Chapel next to it, so Venceslas Chapel of the sacristy, and here's the stairway, um, that's an image there. Um, who was seen as their ultimate guardian. And just to show, because we're discussing about kind of decorated vaults and their relationship, it's, it's very interesting to hear Leslie's thoughts about that. So we here have several ideas. First of all, the vaults don't appear in this inner sanctum where the treasure is actually kept, and that's the same uh, situation on the other side. We do have some very scary capitals there that have been written about. Um, but this is the uh, part, the sacristy that nobody's allowed to enter. It's only open very periodically, about every four years. And this is one such occasion where at least, I think, five different people have to be present with their own keys, including the Archbishop and Mayor, the President of the Republic, and so on. So, um, these rarely seen sacred objects of the state were brought to St. Vitus' altar, the coronation of each successive Bohemian monarch. At the close of Charles of Paul's extensive its equals in 1378, the crown was ceremoniously returned to the house <coughs> by the queen, who placed it on the altar in his chapel. So here's that to shrine in some sort of original altar. This is now the 20th century uh, replica uh, was was wooden man. Nevertheless, the main focus of the religious theatre in the cathedral was on the relics and their display. Following Charles the Paul's coronation journey in 1355, the cathedral treasury received a large donation of relics collected from Trier and Mainz in Rome, and their copiousness resulted in the institution of two new feast days. The first celebrated the relic of the Virgin's veil obtained from Trier and was the tenual feast, which involved a large number of other relics, especially those of St. Metislas. The second relic displayed, the Alatio Reliquarum, the elevation of the relics, commemorated the translation of the relics from Rhine that was celebrated every January. A small balcony situated conveniently above the old sacristy on the north, north aisle, um, famous for another set of the blessed Valerian vaults, uh, was used as a platform for a carefully orchestrated ceremony designed for a large number of um, spectators. And these are, again, Leslie's round-headed windows that you see here. So the original sacristy with these vaults looks a bit different. 
uh, more spectacularly Valerian. And these round uh, headed windows, which also belong to the same structure, um, had a balcony there, which is only known from records um, following the fire, the disastrous fire of 1541. So for the imperial treasure, the real departure in that presentation and reception came with the institution in 1354 of the Feast of the Holy Lance and Nails, celebrated annually on the second Friday after Easter with a public display in Prague's Charles Square, the site of their first reception in 1350. So uh, from this structure you see here, I'll mention the name called Corpus Christi Chapel. Three aspects of this new ritual are of particular interest. In the first instance is the choice of location, a large secular arena or a marketplace, rather than a cathedral or one of the city's numerous churches. Secondly, the presentation of the insignia and relics was given a sound theological basis. The ceremony was con conducted according to a service devised by the emperor and his theologians and followed by the grant of indulgences. Finally, the Holy Lance Feast also inaugurated the development of new relic centered architecture. According to um, Czech Highway and Spanish, their architecture was initially rather modest. It consisted of a temporary wooden platform known in German as the Perth as Altenschluck. Nothing more was permanent, nothing more permanent was required, since the relics were kept elsewhere and eventually at Karlstein Castle, and were brought into town shortly before the ceremony. In 1382, four years after Charles IV's death, the new town's temporary Altenschluck was replaced by a permanent ciborium like edifice dedicated to Corpus Christi, which you can see in the middle of the square there. The initiative for its construction did not come from Charles's increasingly lethargic son, Metasis IV, but from an enigmatic confraternity of the circle with a pendant hammer, who acted as custodians of the chapel until the early 15th century. The chapel was pulled down in 1789 in order to make way for a landscape park. But the surviving evidence shows a centrally shaped structure placed in the middle of Charles Square, encircled by a wall and topped by a tower. The next chapter in the history of the royal treasure suggests that Corpus Christi's ambitious arrangement was not considered to be entirely successful. In 1423, following the sudden death of Bessus IV and the eruption of Hussite unrest in Bohemia, Charles IV's second son, Emperor Sigismund, Spirited the treasure away from Karlstadt to the safety of his Hungarian fortress in Visegrad. Sigismund, son ch changed his mind, sorry, Sigismund soon changed his mind and resolved to deposit insignia permanently in the politically and strategically important imperial town of Nuremberg and, in his words, near the center of the empire. The entrance of the treasure into the city in 1424 was also an auspicious occasion, but the emperor was conspicuously absent. Instead, the procession was led by the Burgermeister, town clerks, and citizens. The insignia and the relics were not deposited in the royal residence, as was to be expected, but in the chapel of the High Geistspital, here, uh, where a large silver chest, let me just show you, mm -hmm. was suspended over the altar um, uh, in chain, chains. And so here is the chest, I'm um, sorry, I've got my glasses, here we are. Um, suspended by chains, and so the chest still survived in the, the Marches Matinales, and, and the bottom part, uh, which would have been seen when it was placed above the altar, shows this of the lines and the cross. The levitation was disturbed only for rare private displays in the chapel, and once a year at the Feast of the Holy Mass and Nails, which was translated to the city with a treasure. The wealth of records surviving from the Luxembourg Feast. Um, uh, from the last book test gives us a better idea of the physiognomy of the ritual and also of its changing nature. Although the town council continued to use the actual setting of the half month, it gradually distanced the ceremony from the earlier overt imperial propaganda. So, instead of the explicitly imperial facade of the Church of Our Lady, which you can see here in this area of view, there and also here. Um, the treasure was shown from a wooden platform erected for that purpose on the opposite side of the square in front of the house of the Shopper family, which is quite close to the Shoney Bruner family, just there, and sort of roughly there. And the wooden platform actually has been drawn in the 15th century, so this is what it looked like. 
In the hands of Nuremberg authorities, the Holy Lance Festival was transformed from a vehicle of, uh, for imperial grandison to a holy municipal affair. The construction of the platform and its adornment was the responsibility of the council and the parishes. The decorative hangings bore the heraldic devices of their donors and not those of the empire. Instead of the emperor, the elders of the town council were known to elevate the reliquaries along, alongside senior prelates. When, in 1513, the council commissioned Dura to paint two imperial portraits for the Schopper House, the choice was not an imperfect expression of political allegiance or historical perspective, but homage to the two rulers who directly or indirectly connected Nuremberg with the treasure. Charlemagne, on the left, as the mythologized collector of the crown jewels, and Sigismund, on the right, who donated them to the city. The latter a gripping realistic depiction of an elderly gaunt ruler, armed only with his private rather than any official interior of the city. Sigismund's metaphorical disrobing was symbolic of the physical and figurative separation of the emperors from their treasure, which had for centuries been the most empowering sacred attribute of their office. The idealized union of the supreme Christian ruler, an earthly Zion, and the sacred treasure actively constructed in Prague under Charles IV was replaced at Nuremberg by that of collective identity, civic pride, and profit. The image of the emperor, once essential for the promotion of Prague's last festival, appeared, uh, disappeared entirely for pilgrims' mementos in Nuremberg, focusing instead on the iconic shape of the lance and the town's patron saints. Not coincidentally, perhaps, the development in Nuremberg came at the time of acute political crisis in the empire, whose court now resided in Habsburg, Vienna. When in 1442, Frederick III Habsburg claimed the imperial insignia for his coronation and challenged the Nuremberg's custodial rights, the city sought legal advice from Padua lawyers and won. With the continuing threat um, of the Turks from the Balkans and the looming presence of Matthias Corvinus on the Hungarian border, Frederick, like Louis the Bavarian in the previous century, may have hoped to exploit the treasure as a symbol of divine ordained legitimacy and to give his troubled reign much needed luster. Vienna did finally get the custodianship of the imperial insignia, including the army crown and the passion relics, but only in 1800, and with a brief interview between 1938 and 1946, when Adolf Hitler rather ridiculously photoshopped here and there. Um, you know, uh, Second World War sense of that word uh, with, a lot, with a sword he never actually held. Um, so he had not returned to Nuremberg, the spiritual center of the new life, thereby stoking up all rivalries between former imperial cities and pointedly demoting Vienna. More than a thousand years after Charlemagne, his crown jewels still had the power to mythologize the past and to revive the specter, specter of the long departed. A German Empire. The discovery of the treasure in 1946, hidden in the so-called Historische Kunstbunker beneath Nuremberg's castle, is a thriller worthy of John Le Carre. The installation of the insignia in the treasury of the Hofburg on the 3rd of July 1954 was a milestone in the history of post-war Austria, and it also marked their translation, transition from the instruments of veneration to the objects of admiration. But that is a whole other story. Thank you.